Hey everyone, it's Jenna. Before we get to this week's episode, I want to let you know that we are running a listener survey in partnership with our colleagues in the Democracy Group Podcast Network. We want to know why you listen to Democracy Works and the other shows in our network and how we can make the content we bring to you even better in the new year. You can access the survey at democracygroup.org slash survey. Everyone who completes it will receive some Democracy Group Network swag. Again, that's democracygroup.org slash survey. Thank you for taking the time to fill it out, and I look forward to hearing from you. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Chris Beam. I'm Candace Watt-Smith. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are going to talk about the Latino vote, and our guest is Geraldo Cadava, who is a professor at Northwestern University and the author of a new book called The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump. And, you know, while there are certainly lots to to talk about in the context of the current election about Hispanic and Latino voters, there are also some bigger questions about those those voters in our democracy. I think that's the angle that we're hopefully going to take here. We'll see, I guess, where things end up, I suppose. But I, I think it, it makes sense to, to start with some of those bigger questions. I think that one of the helpful things about thinking through Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, Americans, generally speaking, are that for decades, we have heard the kind of narrative about the sleeping giant. And for me, I think that what that narrative has been saying is, oh, there's this group of people, but are they going to participate or not? And I think in the context of democracy, in the context of American society, we tend to blame people about, well, why don't you participate? Why don't you turn out? And, and, and instead of thinking about questions of mobilization, questions of parties reaching out um, to include more people, no matter what their group characteristics are, what demographic they come from. So, you know, every four years we get a narrative about whether Latinos will turn out. And perhaps maybe the question should be, what are what is the role of American institutions and American political parties to bring in more people into the into the electorate? And what does that mean for understanding to, to, to ensure that more people's voices are heard here through the electoral process? So I, I want I don't want to lose that track, but I want to add something to it, which is, I think, at least in terms of electoral politics, the inevitable inclination of the politically minded among us is to look at groups mm-hmm. and not individuals. And so when, when you talk about the sleeping giant most people are talking about the ability or the potential ability for Latinos to really shape American politics. But to the degree that there are, uh, you know, important fundamental distinctions among uh, Latino population, that power necessarily becomes, if not diluted, at least harder to get a handle on, right? Right. And so that's part of this conversation too, isn't it? Or no? I think that we should be careful that just because a bunch of people think a certain way doesn't make it wrong. So there's that, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we live in a very um, segregated society. And if, you, and if people don't understand the nuances, then we are likely to get a situation where people feel alienated. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. you know, it becomes more, it, it becomes clearer why people feel like they're not welcomed if you are not willing to invest the time to understand the nuances and the diversity within the group. I think what, you know, Geraldo's book does, does a really great job of, of tracing this history of coalition building by Republicans from Mm -hmm. Eisenhower and Nixon up through 
George W. Bush and, and Marco Rubio and up through the, the Trump era. And, and we talk in the interview about some of the ways that the, the Trump administration, and you know, he argues that his, the Trump campaign's Hispanic outreach might have been the most or, or one of the most traditional aspects of Trump's 2020 campaign. Um, yeah, I remember that, too. It, it, it was striking for, for me to hear that as someone who um, just couldn't imagine, right, how a Latino person would uh, look upon the actions of the Trump administration, you know, from the time he went down the escalator to, you know, a week ago, <laughs> um, how a Latino can say, yeah, that's, that's for me. But, but, you know, it just speaks to the fact that there are, everybody has a multitude of objectives with respect to politics and with respect to how politics connects to their own sense of identity and what's important to them. And that's not going to be uh, monolithic. It's not going to be the same for everybody. Yeah. So we can maybe pick up on some of that uh, at the end. And I think that's a good place to bring in Geraldo and hear about some of this work. So let's go to the interview. Geraldo Cadava, welcome to Democracy Works. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. So, you know, as we come out of this most recent election, I, I feel like you and, and lots of other scholars who study Hispanic and Latino politics have been kind of shouting from the rooftops for, for a while now that these voters are not a monolith. And it seems like everybody's still always surprised about that after after every election. I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, as, as you've had a chance to reflect on these past couple of weeks, if you think that that maybe this message is is getting through now in, in, in a way that it maybe hadn't previously? That's a great question. I, I think that we won't fully know the answer to that until the you know beginning of the next election cycle. And we see whether or not there's a little more sensitivity and nuance to how Latino and Latino voters get talked about. I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, there is always a little bit of a re rediscovery of Latino and Latino voters right after elections. And too many Americans remain surprised that there are millions of Latino voters with serious political ideas who express their views on election day. So so we'll see. But yeah, I agree. It's It's been amazing to watch after this election, the kind of outpouring of attention to how Latinas and Latinos voted and even what Latina and Latino identity in the United States means. Yeah, and, and you certainly do do a, a, an excellent job in in your book, the Hispanic Republican, of of tracing the the rich history of you know conservatism uh, among the Latina and, and Latino population, which I think is is a, a big source of of some of that that surprise that we've seen this cycle. But if if we kind of wind all the way back to the beginning, you you start your book. Um, talking about Desi Arnaz, and I, I just thought that was such a such a, a clever way to open things, and really kind of setting the stage for some of those core values of Hispanic Republicanism. So, can you tell us a little bit of of that story, uh, and then you know how that that kind of foundational idea of, of Hispanic Republicanism might compare to how we think about Hispanic and Latino conservatives today. Opening with the character of Desi Arnaz does a couple things for me. I think first, he is a character that most readers in the United States will know, given his long tenure on the I Love Lucy show and uh, as a kind of pop cultural icon. But I don't think as many people know about his politics or his political background. So it was an opportunity to introduce him in a, a slightly unfamiliar context. I think the other thing he does is that to the extent that we think we know anything about Latino conservatism, it has to do with the Cuban exile story after the Cuban revolution of 1959. And I think what Desi Arnaz points us to is that there's this earlier moment of turmoil in Cuban history that leads to the exile of many Cubans and ultimately leads them to identify with the Republican Party. So 
it's a way of kind of decentering the more familiar Cuban revolution of 1959 as well. And then I think, finally, um, I think Desi Arnaz, you know, played an important role in Richard Nixon's 1968 election campaign, kind of heading his Hispanic outreach effort and reaching out not only to Cubans, but playing concerts in South Texas for Mexican Americans and encouraging them to vote for Richard Nixon. So I think he does a lot of things for me. And your question about how he compares, I think, to Latino conservatives today, Latino conservatism today, I mean, I think he is active in the Republican Party at a pretty early moment in the development of Hispanic Republican identity. It's just still a kind of local, regional, grassroots effort to try to bring Latinos into the Republican Party. And this effort really takes off with Richard Nixon's re-election in 1972. And that's the moment, that's the election when Latinos for the first time give a Republican candidate about a, a third of their votes. And over the years, that has become the more or less the norm, the kind of tradition among Latino voters and has remained that way, even as the Republican Party has taken a lot of twists and turns and moved far to the right on issues like immigration and border border uh, control. Yeah. So what are what are some of the the key issues, you know, uh, whether it's it's policy types of, of, of issues or just some of the, the the fundamental ideologies that you see as as underlying Hispanic republicanism or, or conservatism? Sure. It's it's a handful of issues, just policy issues, cultural issues, a general worldview that have continued to draw Latinos into the Republican Party. And, you know, I would say those have been family values, patriotism, religious liberty. And that's not just the politics of abortion, but also, you know, the religious identity of charter schools and a general desire to blur the line between faith and public life and anti-socialism, anti-communism, law and order, capitalism, all of these things together. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that core set of issues has been remarkably consistent over the past four decades. It was actually uh, Ronald Reagan and his Hispanic campaign in 1980 that tried to first articulate this core set of issues that would bring Latinos into the Republican Party. And it was Reagan who, you know, famously told one of his Hispanic advisors, the the media executive, Lionel Castillo, that, you know, you're going to, not Lionel Castillo, I'm sorry, Lionel Sosa. Lionel Castillo was the first Hispanic uh, commissioner of the Border Patrol. But Lionel Sosa was an advertising executive from San Antonio, and he worked on the Reagan campaign. And Reagan told him, you know, Lionel, you're going to have the easiest job ever because Latinos are natural conservatives. They just don't know it yet. And what I'm amazed by is that that kind of playbook, focusing on those core issues, has remained consistent into the present. And it's also the set of issues that the Trump campaign focused on in its outreach efforts as well. And in some ways, I think Trump's Latino outreach effort was the most traditional, predictable aspect of his campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you 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 talk about this some um, in the the book as well. Kind of the the shift from focusing on on a candidate as you had with with Eisenhower and and later with Nixon, as as you were describing earlier. Really, around 1980, this shift happens where you go toward it becoming you know thinking about supporting the the party as as a whole. You know, Nixon really based his Hispanic outreach efforts on. Uh, politics of patronage and granting, you know, more federal jobs to Latinos. And in fact, that effort led some Latino conservatives to not like Nixon. So I interviewed Linda Chavez, who served in the Reagan administration and was nominated to be George W. Bush's uh, labor secretary until she withdrew her nomination when it was discovered that she had had an undocumented Guatemalan woman living with her. Mm -hmm. But when I interviewed her, she was telling me that she didn't like Richard Nixon because he was the father of the quota system, because he tried to set quotas for how many federal jobs should be given to Latinos. And so patronage was an important part of it for Nixon. And so was high profile appointments like uh, 
appointing the first treasurer of the United States, who was Hispanic, a Mexican-American businesswoman named Romana Acosta Banuelos. And when Reagan came along several years later, he decided that he wasn't going to appeal to groups by you know, playing to their identity, like r- recruiting Latino voters or Black voters or any other group of voters. He was going to just articulate the ideologies, the values that the Republican Party stood for and, uh, you know, trusted that those issues would draw Latinos and others into the party. Yeah. So uh, staying with with Nixon here for, for one more question before we move forward in history, you know, when we think about Richard Nixon's presidential campaign, I think the thing that comes to mind for most people is his Southern strategy. How does the Southern strategy square with this outreach to the Latino population, if at all? Or did they just kind of occupy separate spaces, separate universes throughout the campaign? No, they they were, in fact, deeply connected and, and relied on one another, these two strategies to recruit Latinos and embrace the Southern strategy. Because Republican strategists noted in the late 1960s that African-Americans were leaving the party in droves and they knew that they needed to replace those lost votes uh, with some some from other groups of voters. And so Latinos became the primary targets. And there was a kind of divide and conquer strategy between uh, or the Republican Party used a divide and conquer strategy when it came to Latinos and African-Americans, because one of the ways that they tried to bring Latinos into the Republican Party was by telling them that the Democratic Party, when it came to civil rights, they only cared about African-Americans, but not Latinos. And their civil rights strategy, when it came to African-Americans, was only about offering handouts. And, you know, they knew, the Republican Party knew that Latinos wanted to, you know, they believed instead in this kind of up by the bootstraps, uplift, self-improvement ideology. So, that is how the Republican Party was thinking about the different interests of African Americans and Latinos in a way that would help them bring Latinos into the party. So, so how does that thread continue over time, if at all, and and perhaps to to what extent is it still there today? Oh boy, um, that's a good <laughs> question. And so, yeah, no, it, it. I don't fully know to what extent it is still there today. I do know that even beyond the Nixon years, the Republican Party talked to African-Americans and Latinos separately and in different ways. So in the Ford administration, the Reagan administration, they continued to delineate. When it came to, to, to election time, they continued to delineate the interests of African-Americans and Latinos. And Many Latinos have, in fact, seen their struggles. I'm talking about Latino Republicans here, have seen their struggles and efforts of inclusion within the Republican Party as being distinct from those of African Americans. And, you know, when Obama ran for office, one of the Mexican Americans who had served in the Ford administration, a guy named Fernando de Baca, he had returned to his home state of New Mexico, and he w- took up a post as you know a leader of the Republican Party of New Mexico. And when Obama ran, he said that Latinos wouldn't vote for an African-American. Mm-hmm. And so I think there has been this continuous thread of Latino Republicans seeing their interests and fates as distinct from those of African-Americans. But you look at someone like Trump, I mean, it's kind of really interesting how he really appealed to African-American men and Latino men at the same time. And, you know, with slightly different messaging, but if you take the, the Republican National Convention and what a spectacle it was, you know, it was full of African-American characters and Latin American immigrants and Latinos. And he brought Herschel Walker, the former football player, onto the stage and another gentleman who, um, a former convict, to talk about Trump's criminal reforms. And he also hosted a naturalization ceremony at the White House. And he had the lieutenant governor of Florida, Jeanette Nunez, come onto the stage and talk about socialism and former veterans of the 
Bay of Pigs and, you know, Cuban exiles from Miami. And also in the crowd were Latino and Latina border patrol officers. So, you know, they were still distinct narratives based on criminal justice reform and socialism and immigration. But Trump did to kind of bring all of those narratives together in his campaign in interesting ways. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, the, the big thing as, as people are, are trying to wrap their heads around the increase of, of support for, for Trump that seemed to, to play out among the, the Latino community, there's this notion that, you know, the, the Trump administration put brown people in cages on the border. How could you possibly vote for someone who does that if you are also of that that same descent or, or that that same racial or, or ethnic makeup it's it's a version of the argument i think that we saw in in 2016 about how you know D- donald trump says all of these terrible things about women how could women support him oh yeah i mean i think this is the big question and and you know the thing that needs the most explaining because I think for many of us, it's, it's really a, a, also a, just a moral issue. I mean, how, how could you, I think that's the right tone of the question. I mean, how could you continue to support a president who has done these things? Not only not, or not just necessarily when it comes to quote unquote, our community, but to anyone, I mean, just the whole idea strikes many non-Trump supporters as morally repugnant and unimaginable. And so going further than that, I think it just seems completely unimaginable that this Republican candidate would be the Republican candidate to actually expand support among Latinos. I think that's the real surprise too. You know, George W. Bush got a lot of attention in the early 21st century for winning somewhere around 40% or north of 40% of the Latino vote. And it just seems unimaginable that someone like Donald Trump could be the second coming of George W. Bush. So I think, you know, this is the question we really need to wrestle with. And I guess I have a few responses that, to be honest, aren't necessarily things that, I mean, not even not necessarily, they're not things that I believe or agree with, but I can tell you what Latino Republicans have told me. And one idea is that the media has misunderstood or not covered the immigration story correctly. And I interviewed one former candidate for Congress from South Texas, a woman named Monica de la Cruz Hernandez. She hoped to represent the Rio Grande Valley, the area south of San Antonio down to the border near Edinburgh, Texas. And this is an area that was ground zero for the migrant detention and family separation tragedies. And she told me that when Border Patrol separated adults from children, they were actually protecting the children because the adults they came with were not their parents. And she told me that many of the children were being trafficked for sex work And so when the Border Patrol took them from the adults they were brought by, they were actually protecting them. That's one idea. And again, I don't endorse this idea because I think it's been shown that the vast, vast majority of the adults they came with were, in fact, their parents. Mm -hmm. So another thing they'll say, you know, is that they care less about the immigrant experience because when they rank their priorities... It always goes education, jobs, health care, and immigration falls somewhere below those issues. And so they're not single issue voters, etc. So they just prioritize and make decisions based on those other things that will protect them, help their families, f- help them you know, reach their goals in the United States. One last thing I'll point to that Latino Republicans say is that Yes, of course, they think it's a tragedy that children were separated from their parents and they support dreamers, but they also believe that 
immigration reform needs to happen through legislation and through Congress. Mm -hmm. And they don't believe that a president should be issuing executive orders to issuing executive orders to protect dreamers. So they want to see reform happen through legislation rather than executive order. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good place to maybe start to bring this to a close. What are some of the things you are going to be watching for as we as we look at Latinos in the uh, Republican and party and the, the party strategy more broadly, whether they kind of tend to go more down this this Trumpian route or if they still keep the big tent approach or, or something in between? How are you going to kind of try to discern some of those things moving forward? So there are these two partisan narratives that have emerged, and I really think you need to see them together and kind of immediately right after the election falling back into our partisan camps about how we should understand the Latino vote and whether they helped Biden win or whether they shifted toward Trump. I don't think that helps us actually understand what's going on because I think both narratives can be true and are true at the same time. And I think that's what we need to think about. So I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. I think the Democrats are going to try to figure out how to re-engage Latinos and why they might have lost some support this time. I think Latino Republicans are going to try to figure out how to capitalize on the momentum they had this year. I mean, I, I do hope, I, in my best imagination of it, what 2020 will lead to is a kind of renewed conversation about Hispanic and Latino identity as part of an effort to get to know who Latinos are, not as a voting block, not even as voters, but just as 60 million Americans. And I think an important part of that ha- will have to do with ethnic and racial identity. Well, uh, Jerry, we will leave it there. Um, thank you for this this book, which to, to your point about understanding this group as people rather than voting blocks, I think your your book is a good first step toward doing that. So thank you for, for writing it and thank you for joining us today to talk about it. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun and thought-provoking for me. All right, so Candace, we were talking about this whole, or I was talking about how I um, was struck by the fact that anybody of Latino identity, Latino descent, can look upon Trump's behavior towards people with brown skin, right? I mean, you know, from the moment he went, came out of the escalator calling Mexicans rapists and murderers, and then to, you know, this, the really inhumane separation of families, putting children in cages at the border. Uh, I, I just couldn't understand that, right? And, and, and Jenna actually asked um, Jerry about that. And his answer, I think, kind of speaks to what you were talking about, right? This idea that, well, identity is complex and people are complex and values don't line up um, in a row, right? And, and, um, and sometimes, you know, there's never any kind of, well, that's not true. It's rare. It's, it's not unusual for there to be no bright lines in politics. You know, you just kind of make your choices. And anyway, I mean, is that kind of what you got out of his answer? Yeah. I mean, th- th- I, I did. I, I think that, one of the things that he said, which right, which is there are 60 million Latinos in this country. And for me, I think, and I mentioned this earlier, I think that how this group is talked about and the things that there are ideas that we project onto them that they may not necessarily see themselves. Mm-hmm. So even, for example, just the term Latino or Hispanic itself, right, the category was created by the by the US government in the 70s, right? And so one is like, well, you know, should we expect people to identify with the this this group that this label that was created? In some ways, yes, for those who feel like their life chances are going to be influenced by that category, for others no. Or or just kind of going along the line that you were talking about Chris, is that I think I think that we say like, oh, well, you know, it seems odd that a Latino would not be in complete opposition to a policy around uh, immigration on the border 
because you're Latino instead right. of because your values are this way or because your perspective is that way. And so maybe what we need to do is think about Latinos in the same way that we think about Asian Americans who are a pan-ethnic group, um, that we think about Black folks who are also a pan-ethnic group and tend to get understood as a monolith when they are not in the same way for white voters. We have, you know, people make pitches to different groups of white Americans just as as they should. Um, and, and they should do that for other groups when you, again, if we recognize the nuances, then then we can have the capacity, we, we might see more people being involved in politics and feeling like um, politics is a game to play and that democracy is going to work for them. Um, when you when you slap on a uh, on a, you know, just a wide label and expect everyone to respond the same way, then, you know, I could see that's that being alienating, too. That's all true. But I mean, is it also the case that political consultants all over the all over the country are going to hate me for asking this question? But if every one of these strategies doesn't move the needle much at all, right, if it was 30 percent during Nixon's time and it's, you know, somewhere I mean, and, and I think the top was George W. Bush, who was up to like 44 or something like that. If that's the margins, I mean, I guess when you're talking about 60 million people, those are pretty big margins. But still we're not really changing the narrative very significantly. And we're going back. Desi Arnaz was in the fifties. That was a long time ago. That's older than me. My God, that's a long time ago. <laughs> so one thing that stood out to me, Chris, and I'd be interested to know if you heard, I don't know what, how it resonated with you, but um, in the conversation about how we tend to associate the Southern strategy as kind of uh, a means to, uh, you know, get together disaffected white Democrats and bring them into the Republican Party. And, you know, and also it, I guess I hadn't thought about the element of it also being a pro-Latino pitch. Mm -hmm. And as Jerry was explaining to us that, you know, part of the yeah, that, that that being pro-Latino was part of the pitch, but that also included in some ways an implicit message that the Republican Party is the party for like hardworking Americans who want to believe in the American dream. And for me, that just sounded to me like dog whistle politics for Latinos or, yeah. you know, that like dog whistle, po we tend to think about dog whistle politics as primarily for white folks, but it sounded to me that turns out that maybe there it makes a wider sound than we have talked about historically, which has mostly focused on capturing white voters. Well, the Southern strategy was incredibly effective, right? You basically changed Southern politics from all Democrat to all Republican in a generation, right? And it's just false. It's just empirically wrong to, to act as if there wasn't a racial dimension to that. And so if it is working that successfully, then why wouldn't you try to massage, redirect that same message for this other group? namely, you know, Latinos, right? You were doing it, you were using it on whites with incredible uh, uh, success. Why wouldn't you try it on Latinos? And it's not surprising that for many Latinos, it was an effective pitch, right? You know, I am hardworking. I am a good American. And, and I, you know, and I want to keep my family safe. Well, you know, at some level, you know, that's, a, that's an argument that everyone wants to be part of, right? You know, it, and, and so if you make that in a way that, that is exclusionary, you're in and they're out, <laughs> you know, well, I'd rather be in, you know? And so there is something very uh, appealing and, and kind of, um, I don't know, almost inevitable about that appeal. What do you think of that? Yeah. I mean, I think that what it does again is speak to the complexity of the group and that, there are some who are going to buy into that ideology. And so, you know, I, I, I think that I think that if a, if you are cognizant that a group is diverse and that you can gain some people 
by speaking their language of uh, bootstrap ideology, then you know what? You earn those votes. Mm -hmm, (laughs) If mm -hmm. you, if you did your homework um, and you recognize, Hey, this isn't all about, Hey, we're one group. We're a monolith. We are pro immigration. We are big government. We are, you know, if you recognize that people have various ideas and interests and policy preferences and you speak to those, then you, I guess you get to keep what you get. Yeah, I think that's I think that's that's fair. I I mean, I also think that, you know, to put it in a less nefarious frame, there is I mean, and this is true, I think, of African-Americans as well, that there is this kind of in, for many uh, this kind of social conservatism. Right. About mm-hmm. about, um, you know, going to church on Sunday and, you know, putting family first and pulling your own weight and then a distrust for a lot of changes in, in culture, you know, uh, gay marriage is one example. And so, um, so there is also a pitch to be made there. And if you can combine those, well then, you know, you're you're likely to be successful. But I also think that it is, these things work when it's not just an us, but there's a them Mm -hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And so you are saying you belong with us because you are not like them. Mm-hmm. And that them is always um, stereotypical, denigrating. You don't want to be with them. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, it is it is just, it, you know, we have to be cognizant of the degree to which this pitch is racist. I think that it'll be important for us to keep our ear on the ground between now and the next election and thereafter. I think what tends to happen is that we have these collective aha moments around various groups, and then everyone relearns the word monolith and how it's not necessary to apply to all sorts of groups. And maybe just maybe this will be the one time when we move the lesson forward to the next election, but we'll just have to see. I, I, you know what? I under, I appreciate your hope and I don't want to squash it, but I just think the, the constraints of winning campaigns is always going to push against that anyway, but we'll see. We'll see. So thanks to, to Jerry for, uh, and, and Jenna for a great interview. A uh, really interesting book and incredibly timely, as we've shown. And uh, I'm Chris Beam. I'm Candace Watt-Smith. Thanks for listening to Democracy Works. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Our editors are Mark Stitzer, Jen Bortz, and Chris Kugler. And additional support comes from WPSU's Andy Grant, Emily Reddy, Chris Allen, and Craig Johnson. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please consider leaving us a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. All eyes are on Georgia as two runoff races could determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. I'm Stephen Fowler, and I cover politics for Georgia Public Broadcasting in Atlanta. I'm also host of the podcast Battleground Ballot Box. Join me Tuesdays as we look at how the fight for voting rights and who we vote for could change America. Subscribe at gpb.org slash battleground or anywhere you get podcasts.